This video is part three of my uh, series on basic time series models. It's going to be a pretty short video. I want to do two basic things here. I want to introduce the last of the you know, baseline models that our textbook talks about. Then I want to um, have a summary because I think the previous video was very uh, dense and I want to give a kind of a summary for these benchmark models and how they're going to uh, play into our future. So the last model that our um, textbook uses as a benchmark model is called the Seasonal Naive Forecast. This model is very good if you only have a seasonal effect. So there's no, um, no trend uh, involved. So the idea of a, a seasonal naive forecast is actually very simple. So let's uh, have an example where maybe my, I have seasonality uh, by quarter. So I've got uh, a period that repeats itself every four uh, every four observations. So every uh, fourth quarter is, is uh, you know, maybe Christmas and we see a certain effect there, whereas every first quarter uh, has, has a different effect there. So the seasonally naive forecast um, is simply this. Uh, my forecast of some future period is simply going to be the most recent value that I've seen for that particular period. So if I'm forecasting um, period four, like fourth quarter, uh, sometime in the future, I just use the most recent observed fourth quarter that I have. Likewise, if I'm trying to forecast, um, you know, first quarter sometime in the future, I just use the most recent first quarter that I have. Now, since I have no um, future, uh, you know, no trend, uh, the most recent value is going to be my best uh, indicator of, of what's going to happen in, in that future period. So the idea is very simple. It's basically have a naive forecast, basic naive forecast for each of my quarters individually. So to express this basic idea with notation gets kind of hairy. Um, so this is the formula. It just says if I want to go H periods into the future after big T, this is just saying, well, use the most recent period. So I want to go over maybe some new notation with you, which are these brackets which indicate the floor. So to understand what this means, let's go over to the right, and I think it's real easy to see if you have a table. So this, this basically says take h minus 1, divide by m, and then throw away the decimal part. So let's just see how this works. If h is 1, uh, I would take 1 minus 1 is 0, divide by 4, if I have four periods. So that's zero, and so k would be zero. All right, well, let's try one that's not so simple. Let's do two. So if I do two minus one divided by four, I get 0 0.25, or a quarter. So then these brackets mean throw out the integer part, and I get zero still. All right, so then what this would say is, uh, if I want to uh, forecast one, two, three, or four periods in the future, uh, I need to go back. So this is that, that subscript here. Uh, so, so if it's fourth quarter, I go back zero periods. If I go, if it's third period, I go back one quarter. If it's, you know, uh, uh, second quarter, I go back two periods. If it's first quarter, I go back three, three periods. And that's my forecast. Okay, what happens if I have a value like five? So five would be, five minus one is uh, sorry, yeah, 5 minus 1 is 4, divided by 4 is uh, 1, and so this k value would be 1. Likewise, if I do 6, 7, or 8, I get that, and I would go back the same uh, as I did in the previous one. Uh, so, you know, if, if it's, if, if I want to go 5 periods out, um, I would just uh, use my value from 3 periods ago. If I want to go 8 periods out, I would, um, I would go back zero periods. So I know that uh, sounds kind of complicated, but the, the whole idea is very simple. So the um, variance of the predictioner that we've been using is how many of these 
years, if you will, or blocks of m periods do I go out into the future? And so that's simply k plus 1 times sigma squared. That looks a whole lot like what we had uh, for the basic um, naive forecast. So this is just how many periods out. And so this um, k plus 1 in our case is just how many uh, years out. So it, I, I think I said it very clearly here. It's basically applying the naive method to each month or quarter separately. Uh, with this variance of the prediction error uh, derived, we get the normal prediction interval uh, as we did before, just dropping in the square root of this quantity. So to give us an example, I said that this works very well if you only have a seasonal effect. So we don't really have a data set where we only have a seasonal effect. What we did see, though, is if we use the Amazon data set uh, with, a, with a box Cox transformation, we basically get a linear trend, and we know that we can remove a linear trend with uh, first differences. So let me show you um, how I'm going to cook up a, an example for us. I'm going to take the box Cox transformation of the Amazon data set, and we'll just do first differences. That, that the, the, the trend is almost perfectly linear then. And so what you'll see is we have... Um, uh, so strong seasonality, as we've seen before. We're getting to know this data set very well. So there's a function in the forecast library called snaive that does the seasonal naive uh, forecast. And I'm going to project it out three years or 12 quarters. Actually, that'd be yeah, three years. And so I've just generated um, the, the forecast plot. And so what you're going to see is that... Um, the forecast values equal what happened in the most recent year. So here is our uh, fourth, wh whatever quarter this is, they do great. And so you'll see that matches each time. Um, this period, you're going to see the sales drop substantially. And so that's going to be what we have. I guess this is first quarter. Uh, what we have is the forecast, likewise with the other two. So again, the idea is very simple. The notation's a little bit ugly. All right, my last slide for this, this unit is going to be a slide that we keep adding to. And so um, what I want to emphasize here is the method we're going to choose depends on what components of the time series are present. So remember I said there are four components of a time series, random, cyclical, trend, and seasonal. And so if all we have present is random, so there is no cyclical variation, so there are no autocorrelations going on, there's no trend, and there's no, nothing seasonal, the only method that makes sense is the average method that we went over in the previous video. Now, if we have random with some cyclical effects, for example, a random walk, then what we're going to do is simply use the naive method. And so let me just kind of walk over to the um, uh, document camera for a second. So if, if this is t, and this is my y value, and, I'm, and I have some sort of a random walk going on. All right. Now, how do I forecast in the future? Well, basically the only thing I can really do is, is, is take this most recent value. And, and forecast this out. And so what we're going to have in the, uh, the near future would be something that would allow us to um, capitalize on any cyclical information that I have. So if there are some autocorrelations of, of the errors, in the near term, I can, I can use that information to make a better forecast. But if all I have is something cyclical going on, then uh, ultimately, in, in, in the limit, we're going to be forecasting what this most recent mean is. All right, so um, that's, what, um, that's what this row is. Finally, if there's, well, not, not finally, but um, if we have cyclical with a trend, the drift model will work. We're going to refine that uh, in, the, in the upcoming weeks. But uh, for now, we'll just um, model the, the trend part as the average uh, of the differences and, um, and, and use that going forward. 
So, you know, with drift method, the way to think about it is maybe I have some sort of a random walk that maybe he's going up like this. And so I'm going to take whatever this last value is, and then I'm going to estimate a trend. So maybe this is the trend. And so I go, you know, this was, um, we called this a constant C bar. Uh, this would be the average differences. So however many periods into the future I need to go, I'm just going to multiply, you know, we've been calling that h, h is the number of periods into the future, times the c bar is going to tell me uh, where I think this trend is going. So uh, if we think we have a trend present, then go use the drift method. Right now I've only presented random plus seasonal, and if we have that, seasonal naive will be your method. So we're going to be um, expanding this uh, over the next few weeks where we're going to add a lot of methods depending on the characteristics. We're also going to be adding rows. So what happens if we have random plus cyclical plus trend plus seasonal? Well, we're going to have a method for that. Another direction we're going to be taking this is what do we do if, um, if we have a multiplicative versus an additive time series? And... Uh, we're going to see how these effects can enter in different ways. And so that's a, kind of a preview of where this course is going. We're going to fill out this table and break it out by multiplicative versus additive. Okay, so I um, hope you stay with me uh, in this class. Uh, we have a lot of really exciting approaches to come.